I will come back uh, last lecture of this week I hope you're not too tired um, okay <coughs> so we stop here this morning uh, before I resume uh, any question concerning what we saw before this morning any concern yeah okay <coughs> So I, I explained to you a bit the Newton methods and how it converges and, uh, and why and so on. Um, yeah, we'll discuss that a bit more um, in detail later, but uh, I want to uh, jump a little bit towards uh, how we will use it in, um, in the context of uh, optimization. Um, do you see the screen properly? I need some uh, less light, no? It's okay. <laughs> All right, so um, then come back to the KKD conditions again. So they look like this KKD point satisfying uh, primal feasibility, the constraints, stationary of Lagrange function, and convolutional slackness condition. Um, and uh, in order to start discussing Newton and the KKD conditions, we it would be a good idea to uh, to focus on uh, something a bit less nasty than this whole bag of things. Um, you have inequality constraints in here. Um, we don't know yet how to handle that in Newton. And then we have this uh, condition here, which I um, started to <laughs> prepare you a little bit to this fact, but this is actually problematic to handle via Newton. So we'll discuss that a bit more later. However, and I actually said that uh, in the beginning of the lectures, when you treat problems without inequality constraints, they are actually much, much simpler. And you can start observing that here in this case. For example, if I remove uh, all my inequality constraints, so no H, which means no U, which means no complementary conditions, uh, I'm basically left with these two equations. So even though I have a constraint problem, if I have just equality constraints, I actually just have two fairly simple algebraic equations to solve. Well, they can still be fairly nasty and, uh, and non-linear and everything, but I, I don't have to drag around all these things, like the inequality constraints and this thing here that, um, as a pre-warning, is problematic. Um, so I'll do that. I'll uh, focus on deploying Newton on, on these uh, two equations. And already there, there will be a, a few observations that are interesting. So essentially, so we discussed this morning uh, R, and you want to solve the R f equals zero uh, on its unknowns. And uh, if you work on the KGD conditions, these ones, you have the prime and dual variable, so W lambda. So you basically want to solve R for W lambda, and your R is made of these equations. Uh, and so we'll basically do that, huh? just deploy the Newton methods uh, kind of blindly on this. So you take the, uh, the Jacobian of R with respect to all the variables, huh? both W and lambda. And you'll take Newton steps in W and lambda uh, and basically iterate on this linear system and update W and lambda according to this, uh, these deltas here. With all the stuff we've discussed this morning, possibly reduce steps and, and everything. Um, so now we can unpack a little bit what it would mean to do that because it's already quite interesting. Uh, so what would the Newton direction look like? If I actually write this equation a bit more detailed, uh, I would see that when I form this matrix, it will have components in W and lambda related to the first and second equation and the detail would be that. So we would have the Hessian of the Lagrange function here, multiplying delta W. Then you have a cross uh, derivatives between the prime and dual variables here, multiplying the dual variables. That's uh, the residual of the first equation. And on the second line, that's the linearization of uh, just the constraints. They don't contain lambda, so I don't have a term here, right? Now we can work a little bit um, on these equations and make a first interesting observation. So just uh, remember the Lagrange function, that's lambda uh, phi plus lambda transpose g. So when you take uh, this gradient, essentially you have the gradient of the cost and the gradient of the constraints times lambda. Um, 
which means that once you differentiate again with respect to lambda, this cross term here, what will pop out is uh, just the gradient of the constraint, right? So what happens to my equations is that and you start something forming here, right? You have the Hessian here and the same term here uh, just transposed. Um, second observation on this side, if I just copy back these things here, I'm essentially talking about uh, uh, these things here, these terms. And third observation, so th I have this term here, uh, the gradient of G lambda, and I have something very similar here. And if I group that term and that term, I would uh, see that, right? So that's easy. Um, this lambda plus delta lambda, that will be taking a full Newton step on the dual variables, right? So this is my lambda plus in some sense. I can rewrite uh, these guys in a matrix form and what pops out is that uh, if I do that, so I have a step in the primal variable and a, an update in the dual variables, right? That's a step and that's my next lambda actually. Uh, that will play a role later in the SQP. The, the right hand side is the gradient of the cost alone. We actually don't care about uh, the contribution of the constraints in this context and uh, the result of the constraints. Uh, and the matrix that comes in here has a specific structure. You have the Hessian of the Lagrange function, and then you have uh, something symmetric here, right? So this matrix is actually symmetric. And a block of zero here. Okay with that? Okay, so we often call this guy the Kegeli matrix. Uh, it may have different names, but and that's a nice way of calling it. So we often label this uh, Hessian H. It's a function of W lambda, so primal and dual variables. It will be symmetric, but it's indefinite. And actually, I'll talk about that in a bit, but uh, uh, the number of positive negative eigenvalues uh, is fixed. Uh, so we'll label uh, lambda plus the full Newton step on the dual. So basically, uh, when you solve this system, the term you get here is this uh, lambda plus. Um, the other interesting <coughs> observation here is that uh, the only place where lambda enters is in the Hessian, right? It does not enter anywhere else. Okay with that? Um, as a matter of fact, if I was replacing that Hessian with an approximation in which I don't care about lambda, then I would not even really have to carry my dual variables around. Okay with that? You mean the Lagrange? Say that again? Do you mean the Lagrange and not the lambda? Uh, okay, so, so maybe I will backtrack. So I said the lambda enters only in the, in the Hessian, right? Um, and then I said if I was approximating that matrix by something uh, lambda independent, then I would not even need to care about my lambdas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you directly get the update on the dual variables, not, uh, not a step in that context. Uh, what we'll see, we'll connect that to what we do when we do SQP actually in a bit. Uh, hopefully that will make it a bit clear what happens there. Uh, okay, an example. It's always useful. Um, here is a small NLP. It's actually a quadratic cost function, but also a quadratic constraint. Um, it's convex because you basically rest oh no, sorry, it's not. Uh, that's an equality constraint. So you have to be on the circle uh, with your solution, and you want to go down there more or less. So the solution is around here. Um, so you would want to iterate that system. So that's really what is happening in the computer uh, when uh, we do this, or do this example. So just to give some meat, so the gradient of the constraints, that's uh, 2w, right? It's just differentiating this guy. Lagrange function, I have to collect uh, the Hessian of my cost function. This guy here, uh, the gradient pops out here. And then I have the contribution of uh, the constraints. Remember, I told you this morning, be careful the, um, when you form uh, the Lagrange function, all its gradient, and also when you form its Hessian, typically, uh, 
uh, you would have a contribution from the constraint. So you see it here appearing. Um, so this Hessian would be, well, you see that directly. It's a function of the lambdas in that context. Uh, you can also probably guess that uh, if you have very strange lambdas, like very wrong values as a starting point, you could uh, actually destroy your Hessian in some sense. You could make it like very negative def definite in that context if you pick a very neg negative lambda, right? So um, the, the, the guess you use in your dual variables uh, can matter in that sense. Gradient of the cost. Uh, nothing special here. Okay, so let's try that. So we would apply a very, very basic uh, NLP solver on this problem. And you can recode that and play with that. It would work on, uh, on simple examples. Uh, so you want to monitor that the, um, basically the, the entire R is uh, decreasing. So the gradient of the Lagrange function and G uh, must reach some tolerance. Then you compute Hessian gradients the uh, residual of the constraints, you assemble this system, solve it for um, uh, the Newton step on the primal and the new uh, dual. You could actually, of course, compute the Newton step on your dual variables by just uh, making this, uh, uh, this difference here. It may be useful if you also want to, uh, to take a reduced step on your dual variables. And then you could uh, take that step, so W plus T delta W for some T in zero one. And here as well, if you reduce the step on the primal, you may also want to reduce it on the dual. So that's why you want to maybe rebuild uh, delta lambda. You iterate that until convergence return W lambda. Uh, and that would be like a very simple prototype NLP solver if you don't have inequality constraints. Um, so if you just do that on this example, um, I'll take full steps and uh, I will for example, take an initial guess here on the primal, and I always guess that uh, my dual variable, I'll have only one lambda here, uh, is zero. So my NLP solver it has to go all the way from here down to that point here. And um, here is what it will do. It's actually shooting for the constraint, uh, and then it's trying to uh, seek optimality in some sense. It's kind of going around uh, the constraint, right? Trying to reach the optimum. So it manages to do that. And that's really just coding this, so it's no miracle, no magic. Of course, uh, we can try to start at different places and the outcome will be very different depending on where you start. Um, so here's like a bunch of initial guesses and the first Newton step and second and third. So you see that these guys, they have more or less reached the optimum already while some guys are completely lost in the wood uh, until now. And so, for example, this guide has to go around the full, uh, the full circle, so it will take a while. So if you take very wrong guesses, um, you may take a long time to get there. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a nice problem. You can easily build even simple problems where uh, it's very difficult to converge or it's would just not converge at all or fail somewhere on the way. Um, any question with that? It's good? Yeah, cool. All right, um, so when you form this matrix, you want to solve this linear system to get your steps and uh, updates on the dual variables. Uh, so a good question is, can we do that? Can we compute a solution to that system, i.e. can we invert this matrix? Or is it full rank? Um, and the answer is, uh, it's as almost always um, in, uh, in optimization, things are nice when you have a LICQ SOSC and when you don't, things become more complicated. So you can write that as a theorem. This matrix is invertible in the neighborhood of your, um, of your uh, primal dual solution. Um, if uh, this gradient is for n, for row rank, so you have a LICQ essentially, and um, such that uh, this holds, and that's essentially SOSC. So you have positive definiteness on, uh, on the directions uh, that are not blocked by the constraints. So LICQ SOSC, you can invert this matrix. Uh, 
which means essentially uh, if elastic USOAC holds at your solution, then the Newton iteration will converge nicely uh, in the neighborhood of your solution, right? If you don't have ELICQ or if you fail SOSC at the solution, then usually what happens is that the solver will start converging to the solution and then it will just crash on the way because it will start to try inverting matrices that are not uh, full rank. So it will start generating completely absurd Newton steps. Uh, it will try to do line search on them and never find uh, a step size that improves and at some point it will bail out. Um, so again, if you're using uh, IPOPT as a, as a very robust solver or anything else, and you see your solver struggling massively when getting close to uh, achieving the solution, uh, it could well be due to something like this. Okay with that? Yeah, proving that is just a bit of linear algebra, so it's no big deal. All right, uh, yeah, back to this question. So um, yeah, it's a bit of a detail, but it can be useful uh, in debugging uh, codes and uh, stuff like that. So the, uh, the uh, do you know what the matrix inertia is? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it, it doesn't mean much. It's uh, the number of positive zero and negative eigenvalues you have. So you just take the eigenvalue, eigenvalues of your matrix, count the positive zero negative. These three numbers, that's the inertia. Um, yeah. Um, so if you have an NLP of this form, uh, the KGD matrix, um, yeah. Okay, Is just. That Why do you specify positive zero negative? Is that something different than all negative values? No, you count them. Oh yeah. So you have like oh ten positive, two zero, five negative. That's okay. these three numbers that will be. Yeah. Sorry, I was not clear. I guess. Um, yeah. If your problem is well posed, so if you have SOSC LICQ, uh, then the, the inertia of, the, um, of your KKD matrix is uh, N0M, where N is the primal dimension and M is the dual dimension. So you have as many positive eigenvalues as you have primal variables, like uh, decision variables, and as many negative eigenvalues as you have uh, constraints. Do you know why? Yeah, it's not completely obvious. Uh, it's related to um, to uh, the fact that your Lagrange function is a saddle point. So you have a positive curvature in the primal and negative curvature in the dual. And that's reflected in the eigenvalues um, of the uh, KKD matrix. So you can use that in practice when you generate your KKD matrix, get the eigenvalues, count the positive and negative ones, if it does not match, then you have a problem, right? That's a cheap trick to, uh, to chase uh, difficulties. Could be that your uh, KKD matrix is not properly assembled or that you have an LICQ or SOSC deficiency. Okay? All right. Uh, so I'll prepare a little bit the ground for um, talking about SQP uh, a bit later in the talk. Um, but here is uh, an idea. Um, you can understand this system. So we wrote the Newton step for the KGD conditions with just equality constraints. You can understand this step as solving a quadratic program, AQP. I.e. Uh, this direction I get, the delta W, I would also get this delta W, the one I get from that system, I also get it if I solve uh, this quadratic program. What is it made of? Uh, I have a quadratic term that is based on the Hessian of the Lagrange function. I have a linear term based on the gradient of my cost function, so no Lagrange function here. And then I have a linearization of my constraints, right? If I solve this, the delta W I get will be the same as the one I get in this Newton step. And when I solve this QP, because I have equality constraints, I would also have to use uh, dual variables inside my QP. Uh, 
Uh, it turns out that the dual variables I get, if I solve that QP, they will match uh, the ones I would compute here. Um, if you want to verify that, it's fairly easy. You just write the KKD conditions for your QP here, and you'll see that they match exactly that. So it's fairly straightforward. But that prepares the ground to understanding that when you do Newton steps on, uh, on your KKD conditions, you're kind of solving a QP. So when we will introduce inequality constraints, we'll also look at it that way. So you could uh, think of making basically QP approximations of your NLP and regard that as Newton steps um, on your primal dual variables. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, another useful view of this is that um, essentially what is happening in Newton direction is in some sense um, solving or minimizing a critic model of your, uh, of your NLP. So you can look at this as somehow forming um, a quadratic approximation of your cost and a linearization of your constraints. And I'm saying somehow because um, we're not using the, um, the Hessian of the cost function here, but of the uh, Lagrange function. Uh, but you could almost think that, yeah, we're kind of building a quadratic approximation and solving that instead um, as, a, um, as a proxy for solving the real problem and iterating that until uh, it matches. So we'll come back to this um, a little bit. Okay, um, so I said before, uh, if you take full Newton steps, you may have problems, right? We've seen that it can diverge. Um, so we often want to take reduced steps. And I never really explained how you do that, right? I mean, you have this T that you need to select between zero and one. How do you decide of the step length um, to converge? Okay, we'll talk a bit about that, talk a bit more about uh, this uh, quadratic model question. And to make things simpler, I'll go back to a completely unconstrained problem, so make, make it easy to uh, visualize what's happening. Um, so if I apply this kind of like QPID uh, around this uh, simple problem, essentially I would want to build a quadratic approximation of this cost. I label it Q here, and that's essentially um, my cost at the point where I'm at the moment, a first order term and a second order term. Here the H would be the hessian of that function. It's basically a sec second order Taylor expansion, right, of the cost. Um, the good news is I know how to explicitly minimize this thing over delta W. It's just solving a quadratic problem, whereas I don't necessarily know how to minimize this with respect to W. So then, of course, uh, the delta W I should select to minimize this thing here is basically given by uh, this thing here. It's just take the gradient of that function, put it to zero, and you would have to pick delta W as this uh, expression, right? Mm -hmm. uh, first observation is that if your Hessian is positive definite, uh, you would find a t small enough such that uh, the new cost function you get from moving is uh, smaller than the, uh, the one you start from. So you can just essentially use the, this Taylor expansion to see that. Just replace this w in here and you'll find that uh, you, you can find a, a t that uh, decreases that. So you have the same effect as what we discussed um, in uh, Newton. That's another way of thinking of how this R is, is uh, going down for small enough steps that we discussed before. That's the same story. If you apply this kind of quadratic model approach in optimization, you also have the same results that you can always find step sizes that are small enough to reduce um, your uh, cost function. And as usual, it's uh, bound to be true only if uh, if the Hessian is uh, is invertible, otherwise the Newton step does not exist. And as before, if you take full Newton steps, 
uh, if you take t equal 1, then you don't have any guarantee that is true, right? And so when I talked about Newton, I, I talked about the validity of the linear model. Um, uh, if, it's, if you go too far with your delta w, you, you leave the zone where the linear model is valid and you may not uh, have something meaningful. Um, so if we look at this a bit more in detail, the same way as the Newton step can fail when you apply it to a generic set of equations, when you do this critic model approach, um, you also can uh, fail on improving the, the cost function. And that's essentially related to uh, whether your critic model that you're using to approximate your cost function is, uh, is good enough. It's very easy to make a schematic of that. Um, so let's see a bit what is uh, happening here. So I have my cost function here, the phi, and here I'm like kind of taking a slice of my cost function in the direction uh, delta w, right? So that's where t is zero, and if I was going to take a full step, I would end up here. That's the my say my true cost function, the phi, and the green one is my quadratic model, right? You see this thing, and um, so you see what's happening here. Um, Locally, my critic model is very good, and it stays good for a while. And then my critic model says that if I step all the way here, it would be good, but my true cost function is actually different. If I take a full step, I end up here, and actually it's, uh, it's slightly worse than where I started from. Kind of overshot the, uh, the minimum. So that's one way of visualizing what happens uh, with um, taking full steps and why they don't necessarily work. <coughs> um, so what happens, uh, essentially the problem here <coughs> is that the Hessian is changing a bit too much on the way. So the, my quadratic model it has a constant h in some sense, that's the, the, uh, the thing I have here. Um, so it's, it's a quadratic, so the curvature is the same everywhere. But my true cost function, the Hessian between that point and that point may be very different. But it may be curving up much faster than uh, what you think from this information here. Um, yeah, so it's coming from strong variations in the Hessian of the cost function. If you have constraints, it's also coming from strongly nonlinear constraints. And they will tend to curve your, uh, your Hessian a bit uh, in a strange way. Okay, so when you uh, <coughs> use an LP solvers, so they have to choose this uh, step size t at every at every step actually. And um, in a perfect world, we would want to do this. So basically, uh, compute the Newton step, and then find the uh, the optimal step size, right? Just like go all the way to where the function is minimum and take that step. Uh, in practice how would you do that? I mean, that's really not obvious uh, how you should select your T. I mean, you can Im imagine some, uh, some strategies and divide, devise them, but it turns out that uh, in practice, people observe that trying to solve for the best T is, uh, is not very efficient. Um, so people do something a bit different um, than, let's call it exact line search. Uh, maybe the na name line search can explain that a little bit. Um, if you're taking a, a Newton step, for example, on this problem, and maybe your Newton step would be saying, okay, I think we should go there. Uh, if you search for the point on that line that is the best, maybe around here, um, essentially you're searching along a line if you want. So that's a way of understanding why it's called line search. Uh, but that's the idea, is find, quickly finding a T that is, uh, that is decently good uh, for uh, adjusting the step size. And many algorithms, they use the so-called Armillo condition, um, and it's based on backtracking. So essentially you try a full step, evaluate the cost on that full step, and if it's uh, not very good, you reduce T um, until it's, uh, it's acceptable. And Armillo is based on a very simple rule. Uh, 
and as often you know, you know all these algorithms you have like some strange parameters that uh, people know more or less where they should be but then they tweak them a little bit because they observe that it tends to work better that's the, always the same story so uh, here is a like a pseudo code for an army uh, backtracking line search so you start with t at one and then you check this condition and there is a very simple way of understanding what we're trying to do here um, this thing here essentially boils down to drawing a line between where you start and the minimum of your quadratic model, right? It's this red line essentially. And what you're gonna test, you will test um, step length t along this line. And if you find, if you evaluate your function for a given step and it's below the line, uh, then you will find this, uh, this step acceptable. So for example, if you go to full step, well, you're much above the line, uh, so you will reject that. And then you would basically uh, multiply t by a factor, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.7, to reduce it a little bit. And um, so you will evaluate at a shorter distance. Uh, the function is still above the line. I'm not happy. I backtrack a bit more. And at some point, maybe you'll jump here, and you'll see, oh, the function is, um, or my, my new point is here, the line is above. I'm happy with that, right? Um, yeah. There are a few remarks. Um, if alpha is too small, uh, you may accept um, uh, steps that have a bad improvement. So alpha too small would actually uh, twist the line up and you may be happy a little bit too quickly. Uh, for sure you don't want alpha to be less than one half. Why? Because if your cost function was truly quadratic, you would want to be able to accept going down here. If you were more than one half, you would basically <coughs> twist your line like this and say that, well, this is not good enough, but that's as good as it gets. So uh, there is no reason to uh, reject that. And often you actually uh, um, tweak it a little bit up so that uh, <coughs> you're a bit uh, tolerant on, uh, on accepting that. <coughs> you often have also in these strategies uh, a counter condition that prevents alpha from becoming too small. Um, so you can backtrack a bit aggressively and if, uh, if t is too small, sorry, if t is too small, um, you would increase it back, increase it, increase it back. Uh, so you have the Wolfe and Goldstein conditions, for example. So similar stuff, but just to push uh, T upward again, if, uh, if the improvement is not as good as it should. So when you see uh, step sizes popping up in your, um, in your optimization algorithms, uh, you often have them reported in this, uh, this list of outputs. It's typically what is used in the background, not necessarily this one exactly, but things of this type. Okay with that? Okay, that's interesting. Um, <coughs> so we discussed a little bit how Newton converges. I showed you this, uh, <coughs> this um, big equation so this morning, but um, so if you remember, the convergence is quadratic. So essentially you double the number of accurate digits at every time you step, if you can f take full steps. Um, now, if you need to backtrack, the story changes. Um, and uh, there are some results as well on, uh, on how this works. And I will show you the unconstrained case, but essentially uh, all the principles apply also if you have constraints. So it does not make a big difference. Um, so we can make two simple assumptions. First, the Hessian is bounded. That's quite reasonable. Um, and it also has some Lipschitz constant. So how the Hessian or how the curvature of your function is changing, uh, it, cannot, it cannot jump too, too quickly in some sense, right? Or it cannot jump essentially. So you have some Lipschitz condition on, the, on how the curvature is changing. If you have that, uh, so don't get scared by uh, all the symbols, essentially the bottom line is that you have two phases of convergence. 
the first phase is called damped and the second phase is called quadratic. So that's actually the normal convergence of Newton. And um, what happens essentially is the damp phase, it's a very poor contraction. So all the damp phase guarantees <coughs> for you is that the cost will decrease, but it may only decrease of, of a fixed amount, right? So 0 0.8, 0 point, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and so on maybe. Uh, but the damp phase happens if, um, if you're quite far from the solution. So if the gradient of phi is not very good. And then at some point, once you are close enough to the solution, so your gradient is small, then you actually have a quadratic convergence. So essentially, again, you have this effect that uh, this square thing, yeah? so the, the digits of accuracy would, uh, would uh, double every time. And that's the theory, but it really does happen in practice <coughs> in your solver. Uh, what happens essentially is that when you're far from the solution, you have the damped phase. <coughs> and what's really happening is that simply uh, your line search is taking uh, reduced steps. And then there's no guarantee of how quickly you converge to the solution. And then at some point it gets close enough to the solution and it enters this like sweet zone where you converge fast. And then you have full steps and you get a uh, quadratic convergence. And typically what happens is not always entirely true in practice, but in theory, once you enter this like nice zone where you go fast, you stay in that zone. So you basically um, approach the solution. At some point you kind of fall into the black hole and, and get to the solution. Um, yeah, maybe a remark on this constant. Um, so if, uh, if this Lipschitz constant is large, which essentially means if the curvature of the function can change quickly, uh, then um, you get a smaller uh, uh, quadratic region. So this eta that is telling you how close you have to be to the solution to get uh, quadratic convergence will decrease for a large L. So essentially the less quadratic your function is, uh, the smaller this nice region is. Um, yeah, it also impact the, the contraction rate of the quadratic zone. And so you really do, so this, do see that in solvers um, over the iterations. If you log, I mean many solvers, they don't give you that they should. Uh, if, they, uh, if you log the step size, <coughs> It's very common to see uh, the step size floating very low, right? Very small steps. And at some point it kind of shoots up to one <coughs> and, uh, and then stays there. And the consequence of that is uh, if you evaluate uh, whichever um, exit criteria you have, for example, unconstrained problems, the gradient of your cost, you kind of go down very slowly and then kind of crash here very quickly. Uh, that will be in a log scale, huh, typically. Uh, and that's the damp phase. It's kind of creeping to convergence, and then at some point, it goes down very quickly, okay? There is one uh, interesting consequence to that. <coughs> it's very practical, but uh, uh, it could be tempting if your problem is a bit uh, slow to solve, to say, ah, I'm gonna use some uh, lax tolerance because uh, then I will solve faster the problem. It never fixes uh, the difficulties unless you have some other problems in there. Why? Because essentially, as soon as you enter the quadratic zone, uh, you have this effect of the Newton step, like 10 to the minus one, two, four, eight, 16. So in a few iterations, you'll reach whichever tolerance you want. <coughs> Uh, so if, you have, if, if your solver struggles to reach the uh, high accuracy or to reach convergence, um, you should rather work on getting closer to this quadratic region, so better initial guesses, rather than relaxing the t tolerances. Does it make sense? Yeah? 
So if you have constraints, it's kind of the same stuff. It's just that uh, you can replace um, these questions here by the Lagrange, uh, the Hessian of the Lagrange function. And you have a number of things that can happen. Yeah, maybe uh, just, just a few remarks, things that you can find in, liter in the literature. Um, <coughs> so line search is one technique. There are trust regions techniques as well. Uh, it's essentially trying to build um, um, a picture of where the model is valid, but something more like a, like a space in your search uh, space uh, where it's valid. Uh, one typical thing is to use uh, description as a as a ball or as an, an ellipsoid. You're at a given point and you'll build, a, for example, a ball of radius r, and you somehow from test points you know that in that ball uh, the Kojic model is is good enough, and so you'll let uh, your solver take take steps within that region. Um, they are not so used anymore. Uh, one reason is if you want to <coughs> solve the quadratic problem but also contain the step within a ball, then you actually solve QCQPs. Huh? We saw that yesterday, uh, like having a constraint on the norm, for example, or the two norm, you get this kind of thing. And these things are a bit harder to solve than QPs, so um, uh, it's not so favorable. Yeah, okay, filter techniques, that's also the kind of attempt that has been made. <coughs> the filter techniques, they actually will uh, monitor, that's for constraint optimization, they will monitor the cost function and the constraints uh, separately in some sense and make sure that uh, you have progress uh, in some sense on both. So if you, if you take all your iterations and report the constraints on one axis and the cost on the other one, essentially um, you want to move down uh, to this side and to zero. And so you could build a Pareto front of uh, all your points in some sense and accept new points only if you are uh, to the left and downward from that uh, figure here. Um, so just to point to the terms you can find. Uh, but in most uh, algorithms today, uh, people mostly use uh, line search just for its simplicity. All good with that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I should talk about that as well. Uh, so, when you mix, uh, well, when you have constraints in the problem, um, you may have to accept that you increase your cost function at some point uh, in order to move closer to the constraints. Um, one would be very easy to sketch an example. Um, say uh, my cost is like this and then I have a constraint like that. So the solution would be here, roughly speaking. If I start my uh, algorithm here, uh, it's very good in terms of cost, but it's not feasible. I'm not on the constraint, so I'll have to uh, step away from this point. So basically, I have to increase the cost in order to meet the constraint. And um, so the, the question is, how do you measure the performance of different points so that you can do line search and accept points or not, provided that you will increase the cost? So how do you measure progress when you have to mix uh, the cost function and also uh, the constraints? So that's why you have the so-called merit function. Uh, so I'll describe this in this context also, uh, equality constraints. Um, so you're trying to satisfy the KKD conditions by taking Newton steps, or for example, solving QPs. You get your uh, directions, uh, primal and dual. Um, what we know is that uh, if you take, if you compute the Newton step, we'll be able to find a t small enough such that you decrease the residual. Now you have to select the t, uh, for example, using uh, line search. So one thing you could do is uh, select your t and just measure these norms and say uh, if the norm is small enough, I will accept my t, like build some, some kind of army you like 
uh, strategies. Um, so you can monitor this, this norm uh, to ensure convergence, and that works. Uh, but there are some caveats. Um, one of them is that uh, if you want to evaluate this R, you will need to calculate the gradient of your constraints because it will enter in, uh, in the gradient of the Lagrange function. On a uh, number of optimization problems, calculating these gradients is fairly expensive. It's often fairly cheap to <coughs> evaluate G, but much more expensive to evaluate the gradient. That's the case for uh, optimal control, for example. <coughs> so then you want to test uh, different values of T's. So if you have to calculate that every time, uh, that can be a bit uh, expensive. So the idea would be to build a, um, a measure of progress that involves only uh, the cost and the constraints to make it as simple and cheap as possible. Um, a very classic tool is the T1 merit function. And the way it's mixing up uh, the costs and constraints is by essentially summing the costs plus some uh, scalar uh, factor times the one norm of the constraints. Um, do you know why we need a one norm here? Why it's not good enough to, for example, use a two norm on assessing constraints? Uh, it's not obvious, huh? Yeah. Because the you two know, become infinitely small derivative when you're close to the line. So you'll never actually touch the constraint, you just get close to the constraint. Yeah, I think uh, you probably get the, the idea. Um, because at the end of the day, you want the constraints to be satisfied. Um, so if you use a two norm on assessing a constraint. Uh, there is kind of like in a very small neighborhood around zero, there is not really any price in not being exactly at zero. Um, so in this context, um, uh, the two norm would not be a very good indicator of, uh, of uh, the constraint being satisfied. There is um, it's maybe getting a, getting a little bit off topic, but uh, people do that a lot in optimization, and I think it's good to mention that uh, at some point. Um, <coughs> people do often, especially in control and especially in real-time control, pe <coughs> people often do uh, so-called constraints relaxations, <coughs> which is essentially saying, um, I'm not sure I can enforce my constraints, so I will turn them into a cost, a penalty when I violate them. And what they do is essentially, maybe not on all the constraints, maybe only on the, the important ones, they would uh, essentially put them uh, in the cost function, right? Mm. So the problem is if you, if you use a two norm here, um, you, your solver will always find solutions that violate the constraints. Because if they don't, you can always trade a little bit of constraints for gaining a bit of cost. You don't get this effect if you use a one norm and a large enough penalty. Then uh, you're kind of putting a, a, a V-shaped function around your constraints. And if the slopes are large enough, the solver will want to be at zero. Okay, that's just a remark. Uh, if you do constraint relaxations, you uh, probably uh, need this. And that's kind of mimicking that. It's essentially what's happening here. <coughs> so a few properties. Um, if your uh, primal dual solution is regular KKD point with SOSC, the usual stuff, uh, then this uh, T1 function is, uh, or this point is a minimum of this T1 uh, merit function. So you cannot, so W is a solution of the problem, you cannot change W such that you uh, uh, decrease the merit function. But that's only valid if this new is large enough. So, and the condition is that the new should be larger than the largest um, dual variable you have in your problem. Um, if, 
uh, you find a point W that is a minimum of this merit function <coughs> with the correct new, but you still don't satisfy your uh, equality constraints, then you have actually reached uh, an invisible point and you cannot, uh, basically your iteration has failed. Um, yeah. So essentially, roughly speaking, minimizing the T1 function is the same as uh, solving the problem. Uh, so we'll not use it, use it to solve the problem, but we'll use it to check that uh, the points we are trying um, are, uh, are making progress towards uh, solving the problem. So you can use your T1 merit function uh, in your RMEO condition, for example, and everything else works the same. Um, so you have, uh, <coughs> you have convergence with line search of Newton. It looks like the damped and quadratic phase I mentioned before. Um, and as usual, you need to respect some basic constraint qualifications. There's one small difficulty when you implement these things. Um, so you would need to respect that condition. So choose the mu large enough, <coughs> uh, ideally uh, close to this value. But it's a bit of a catch-22. You don't know lambda star before you have solved the problem. So how do you choose the new correctly? Um, so solvers typically use uh, adaptation, like adjustments on the news, like guessing something. And if the lambda has become large, it's adjusting this new to make sense. Uh, of course, you could choose a new very, very, very large, to be sure. But then the problem is that your T1 function will put a lot of emphasis on uh, respecting the constraints. So it would basically, if you apply a line search over that, you will basically reduce the steps until the constraints are improved, uh, not caring so much about the objective function. So you may, uh, you may sacrifice performance because sometimes you should uh, rather go a bit more for optimality than for uh, solving the constraints in some steps. Okay with that? Yeah. So if you see all these keywords uh, in papers and different places, hopefully you will uh, remember uh, where they come from. Um, yeah, you can prove that uh, a Newton direction is a decent direction for the T1 merit function. Uh, it's also, it's kind of the same construction as before. The only uh, tricky part is that you need to uh, take derivatives along this uh, one norm and there are different ways of handling that. Uh, in the slides I, I show one and uh, yeah you conclude essentially that you have something that looks a bit like before. I think I need one more step. Yeah it's a lot of stuff <laughs> uh, but essentially uh, that's, that's the end result. So your the derivative of the t1 function for t uh, is negative as long as you have uh, SOSC <coughs> and as long as you pick uh, the news uh, correctly. Yeah. So you can check that offline if you're interested. <coughs> Any question on that? Should we take a break or where are we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should uh, throw a chair or something. <laughs> Stop me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>